Welcome to a brand new episode of the Whole Story Podcast. I'm Alex Fuse, and joining the show today, Dayton Moore. He will begin his 16th full season with the Kansas City Royals and the first as a president of baseball operations. Dayton, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. This is a new role for you. So has it already been a challenging or learning curve for you heading into your first year as the president of baseball operations? Well, thanks for having me on, Alex. Good, good to be with you. Um, I appreciate your question. Um, yeah, you know, it's 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 really a lot of the same. Uh, you know, the, the core group of our of our front office um, has been together for a long time. Uh, most of us, you know, 15, 16 years here. And 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 really, you know, we started together, you know, w- with the Braves and um, where we knew each other growing up, you know, playing or scouting against each other. So it's a it's a very experienced group. Uh, the um, the core group of our leadership team could truthfully uh, do very well in a variety of roles. Uh, there are a lot of experience, a lot of success, um, and uh, but I, I'm enjoying I'm enjoying this opportunity, uh, being able to transfer some responsibility, you know, give uh, some you know opportunity to others. And I think that's what is the most satisfying part of leadership, you know, is you get a chance to 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 provide opportunities for for other people. And um, and, and that's been that's been exciting to continue to watch, uh, you know, members of our front office and flourish and and take on new new roles and and be invigorated when they come into this office and and meet and and uh, and discuss things that uh, you know I know are going to be beneficial to the Royals long term. But uh, you know my my principal you know responsibility is has always been one of evaluation. Uh, as you know, I grew up as a as a scout. started started as a college coach actually, and uh, became scouting became a scout with the Atlanta Braves in in 1994. And that was a scouting rich organization, and I had great mentors along the way and Paul Snyder and Roy Clark and Donnie Williams and, and Bill LaJoy and, and, and so many other just great scouts and, and uh, had a chance to learn so much. So, you know, that, that part of my, <clears throat> of my job is not going to change. I mean, still evaluating players uh, at the major league level, our, our 40 man roster, our 26 man roster, our minor leagues, uh, our amateur scouting processes, our international scouting operation, and uh, it really is going to allow us to, um, you know, put JJ Piccolo as the GM in a role where he's he's mostly going to be responsible and work daily with Mike Matheny and the coaching staff on the development of the forty man roster and those twenty six uh, players that are suited up each and every night, uh, you know, at the major league level. You've gone on the record previous times that you said that there hasn't been a day in your life that you have not thought about baseball and this game. You said at times that you felt that you have been burnt out and you've asked yourself, should I stay in the game? Should I go do something else? So you asked Mike Matheny this and I'll ask you this. Why did you do it? Why did you decide oh, at this point oh, in your point in your career to become the president of baseball operations? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I'm ashamed to say that uh, I don't know if it's the healthiest thing to think and dream about baseball every single day. You become addicted to this. Obviously, it's something we've been doing since we were little boys, right? So uh, it's natural for us to to just be consumed with with baseball, and it's so stimulating and challenges us and uh, and forces us to continue to think and think outside the box and and seek other people's opinions at, at all different levels and experience levels, um, you know, throughout the game. And, and that's the beauty of, of what we get to do. Um, but, you know, when I, when I find myself, um, you know, you know, getting burnt out or, or, um, you know, asking, you know, is there something else I need to do? Usually I can trace it back to maybe a dispute that I need to settle with somebody else because, or, or I need to quit worrying about things. And, and so when you're in conflict with, with others or um, you're worrying about maybe your future or, your, or the future of your family and the people you care most, most about, most deeply for, uh, that's exhausting. 
And uh, the only way I truly I get through that, Alex, is my faith. Um, you know, I've learned that uh, God's not impressed with a, a general manager of a baseball team, and he's certainly not in awe of a parade of 800,000 people celebrating a, a world championship. And I think he, he gives us those blessings, um, but he expects us to do more with, with those responsibilities. And so the more responsibility that that we have, uh, the more that's expected out of us. And, uh, you know, what, what really motivates me to stay in this game? Yes, I love it. I love the competition, but I also, uh, I, I want to use this opportunity. I think as we all do is just a platform to, to help people and to do good and, and to provide opportunities. And, and I love sharing, uh, with others, especially my mistakes, um, I think that's that's how I've learned in life, and and I like to share some of the mistakes that I've made. And so, there's times that I've made baseball my god, and I'm not a, I'm not afraid to admit that. Uh, but those are the times where I start getting burnt out when I'm too focused and, and involved with everything that's going on, and and don't have it in proper perspective. And so. Each and every day, I've always felt that if you don't begin the day by asking God for wisdom, asking God for help, giving the day to him, asking him to have less of me and more of him um, in, in my daily walk, um, you know, that's that's when I find uh, that I start getting burnt out. I'm, I'm not I'm not focused on those fundamentals of life that free me up. Right. And so every relationship there's fundamentals to every relationship there's fundamentals to every family uh fundamentals for you know every sport that you always go back to when you're in times of trouble or struggle and and for me you know that's the main thing being focused on the fundamentals of life that uh pertain to me and what frees me up what would you say your top three fundamentals are well, I, I think there's more than three, but, um, you know, for me, I've tried to always outline the following and try to live my life in the following way and, and, and be accountable in, the, in, in, in these areas. First, I want to I want to be a peacemaker. I want to settle disputes quickly. Um, and to do that, you've got to forgive on a daily basis and you got to you got to practice that daily forgiveness of of others and, and self. I think it's important to be responsive uh, to people. It's, it's very difficult to be responsive to everybody that, that tries to reach out, um, but you've got to be responsive to the people that you care about and you work with the closest on a daily basis. It simply shows that you care about what they're experiencing. I believe it's important to have an above and beyond attitude, give people more than they expect. It shows that you're willing to serve them. So, you know, there's a few that, you know, I try to live by and, and uh, you know, the, the other the other one that I think is really, really important is is to, is to make sure you're involved in one on one communication with people. And, um, you know, it's it's easy in today's world to send out an email to the vast numbers and and uh, get on a Zoom, uh, you know, with a, a group of people. And, sh- and those certainly are effective ways to communicate. And 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 you should, you know, communicate that way at times. But I think the most important uh, communication is one-on-one in small groups where we get to sit down with each other and, and listen and, and understand what others are experiencing and, and hear their stories. And, and you begin to connect with people that way. And, and um, you know, it's I've learned a long time ago, yes, as I said, there's times you have to stand up in front of a group. You have to try to inspire and articulate the message and lay out the plan. Um, but it's very difficult to build a consensus that way and get people on the same page. And, and so I've learned the hard way that by making mistakes that, no, yes, when you stand up and cast that vision to the group, then you've got to go one on one, sometimes before that meeting. And, and that's a good, good practice to, 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 to take part in. But after the meeting, you've got to make sure that you're intentional about speaking to people. If they have any questions or, you know, I believe in you. And, and, and certainly, um, you know, we live in a world today where it, it seems like it's very difficult for some to genuinely celebrate the accomplishments of others. And when people do fail and have setbacks, it seems like we delight in those setbacks and, and, and we're OK with people being kicked when they're down. I'm not OK with that. I want to stand up for people 
And so that's another absolute that I think is really important in, in, in who we try to be and, and in leadership. And, um, and so, um, you know, there's just a lot of different facets of that, Alex. And, you know, we could talk all day on it, but, uh, you know, it's things that, that we're, we're really, really passionate about. How would you say your values of the game of baseball has changed from when you first got into college coaching to now? You know, my values, I don't believe have changed at all. I love players. Um, I love baseball, but I love baseball players more. I have such an appreciation, as I think most people do, that um, care deeply about this game. We, just the, the commitment it takes to be a baseball player. And just because you run fast, jump high or stronger than everybody else doesn't mean you're going to be successful in our game. If you want to be, a, I have great respect for those that are a high school player. I mean, it took a lot of commitment and sacrifice and, and, and repetition and a relentless focus on trying to get better and develop the skills necessary to be a high school player, let alone a college player or a minor league player or a major league player. I mean, it just takes so much sacrifice and commitment. And, you know, what and not only that, but just what you have to to go through and manage, you know, mentally and, um, you know, the, the focus and, and the concentration and and overcoming failures and setbacks. And, you know, whoever manages failure the best in baseball is, is probably going to reach, you know, their, their, their ceiling. And, and that's the same way in life. I mean, there's very few days, Alex, that I put my head on a pillow at night. And said, my goodness, I just had the most perfect day. And, um, you know, there's and, and so how do I get prepared each and every day to manage some of those failures and setbacks? Well, I follow uh, some of the, the leadership and the models of, of guys like Alex Gordon. How did Alex Gordon deal with failure? Well, Alex Gordon dealt with failure because he just kept preparing. He took he put good things into his body. He put good things into his mind. He was well rested uh, and ready to face the day. He he sought out um, uh, individuals who could help him, who could speak truth into his life, could give him wisdom, uh, and and it's where he could share what he was going through, and and so he could learn from others, um, and so he was prepared to go through the challenges. And, um, you know, he worked extremely hard off the field and, but he worked harder off the field at being a husband and a father. And so when you, when you, again, when you're taking care of the things that you love the most and the people you love the most, that frees you up to go about your day as a professional baseball player. And, um, you know, gives you the freedom of mind um, to experience some of those failures and, and, and challenges and persevere through them. And so, you know, I just, I love, I love what baseball players are about. I think they're some of the greatest leaders in the world. I think the game shapes and molds uh, you as a leader, whether you're, whether you realize it or not. I mean, everything that you, the lessons that you learn in a baseball game in one season, let alone your entire career, those lessons that you learn applied appropriately can, I believe, prepare you for, you know, great levels of uh, high levels of leadership at whatever you do. But the most important leader is the it's the father, it's the husband, it's the brother, it's it's the teammate. I mean, who you are as a person and, and, and the values that you're modeling is uh, what is going to define you. Uh, in my mind, as a quality leader. You mentioned the father part of you. Did you Do you feel like your appreciation for baseball has changed at all, watching your son, Robert, do what he has done and go through his journey in baseball so far? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it has, um, you know, because I, I watch how hard he works and how much he cares and how much he studies. Um, and, um, you know, so I think it has, uh, you know, and it, it takes, uh, and, and, and oftentimes, Alex, I must tell you that, um, you know, I, I try to, uh, interject with, with other things, um, other than baseball. I don't want our relationship just to be about talking baseball all the time. And, um, so I, I try to get him involved in, in other things, you know, he's a very good, um, he, he's, he can, he can sketch. 
he can he can sketch uh, uh, all kinds of you know portraits of people and and uh, and scenes and so forth. But he's he's kind of I think he I think he compares himself to you know some of these really really gifted artists and and um, and, and is bashful about being open and, and sharing some of his sketch work, but you know, I think it's terrific. And, and I'm, I'm really trying to encourage him to, to go in that direction a little bit at times too, and, and develop that artistic ability that he has. I think it's a special gift. No doubt. How do you balance being a father watching him play baseball, but at the same time, you know, now the president of baseball operations, uh, do you think that's going to be different at all now that you're in the new role versus the old role as general manager of the Royals? No, I think it'll be the same. Um, you know, I, I enjoy so much watching all of our children do the things that they love to do. Uh, you know, just try to be a, a cheerleader and, and um, a resource if indeed they want to, you know, talk about, you know, what, what they're, they're experiencing. And I always looked for, I always wanted to be present, more present on those days and times when, when our children uh, had failures and setbacks. And so whether I was watching our girls in dance and they didn't uh, receive uh, the honor, or the highest honor or, or, or what have you, and they didn't have the most, the, the, the best day or, or Robert didn't have the best day in baseball or basketball or what have you, uh, I always was looking forward to be a parent on those particular days because I knew that that was a chance for me to get in there a little bit and encourage them and and um, to tell them it's okay and to keep going and just simply say you know what, i really love watching you girls dance and compete and you guys work really really hard and i'm proud of you and then the same thing with uh, our son and that, that's how we, we've tried to do it um look if he has a great day on the field like what what did i have to do with that i mean that's i i mean i, I certainly celebrate it but um that's his day uh, but I want to be there when when he goes through, you know, the tough times and just say, look, look, son, I care about who you are as a person. And and the baseball thing is is, uh, you know, I, I know you work hard, but look, there's it's OK. It's part of it's part of the game and you're going to have struggles. And it's just like in life. Right. I mean, you're going to have struggles. You know, you go through that first year of marriage. You know, it takes a while to get to get used to, you know, living with somebody and. And, uh, and and not being focused on self and knowing that you got to focus on the other person. And as soon as you stop focusing on the other person, well, that relationship begins to change a little bit. And, uh, you know, those are the fundamentals that I was talking about. I mean, you, you, you abandon the fundamentals that make things successful. You're probably going to have some setbacks and failures and, and so forth. Obviously, you've had to watch more college baseball now that your son is playing it, but you've watched college baseball throughout your entire career. Is there something college baseball has that you wish Major League Baseball had? Well, I think that um, in, 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 in both games are, are terrific. Um, you know, I, I like the, the youthful enthusiasm, but I think we're seeing a lot of that in, in, at the Major Leagues now as well. Um, you know, regardless of what people might think, just because I was raised in a traditional setting and the Braves, you know, had this stoic uh, reputation and it was all business. And yeah, it was. But Bobby Cox had a lot of fun and those players had a lot of fun and they created a great atmosphere. And, and so some of that reputation was earned, but some of it was, uh, you know, it was a little overblown as well. And um but I've always enjoyed players showing raw emotion and competing. And, and uh, you know, I'll be honest, I mean, the, the thing that, um, you know, I understand why, uh, you know, we have instant replay at the major league level. And, and um, I think the Royals have benefited greatly of, because of instant replay. But, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm still a fan because uh, I think it takes the emotion out of the game. Um, and I, I think that I like, I think you need a motion to get through 162 games. Um, I think one of the things that, um, challenges players and develops players is when they have to overcome setbacks or different 
challenges in the game. Sometimes the, the, the ball's not going to bounce your way. You're not going to get the call, whether you're uh, on defense or on offense. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, you, you sit in the clubhouse at night or after the game, and you say, man, man, we just, you know, it didn't go our way. We didn't get the call. And, but it, it, it motivates you to come out the next day and work harder and try harder. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? And so I think there's a lot of things that we put into this game today at the major league level that, you know, I, I think it, it makes it a little different. Um, but the one thing I will tell you is major league baseball players adapt better than anybody else in the world. And um, they are special athletes. You have a special heart and a special mind to play this game. And the players are the ones that will always make the game special, uh, especially the ones that play hard, connect with the fans, interact in the community, um, embrace the diverse populations in the game. And uh, as I said, reach out to all those involved and um, fans, media, groundskeepers, certainly their teammates, coaches, all the fans, um, you know, everybody associated, you know, with the game and the players are the ones that will keep it alive. Do you have a favorite baseball game memory? Man. Um, you know, I would say the two that stand out most for me are, um, you know, well, there's a lot. I remember, I remember my first baseball game. Um, you know, watching the Cincinnati Reds play the the San Diego Padres, and ironically, uh, it's crazy to think like this, but one of my mentors, Donnie Williams, uh, was actually the third base coach uh, of the Padres at the time. And then, you know, then I get to meet him, and and he's helped me so much, and been such a a dear friend. And you know, I, I love the man greatly um, for everything he's done for me, and he still works for us here with the Royals and. Obviously, we worked together with the Braves, but, you know, I remember that game and, uh, you know, game six of the World Series in, in 95. Uh, I watched it on TV, but, um, you know, I was a scout with the Braves and, and to watch that team win a world championship. And then, of course, you know, the wild card game we had here uh, against uh, Oakland in 2014. I mean, that was a that was a game that taught me a lot. Um just the, the perseverance and and regardless of, of of where you are, what the scoreboard says, you don't play to the scoreboard. And yes, I, I get it. You got to you got to know the score and and what have you. But um, you just keep playing. Doesn't matter as long as you got outs left. You just keep playing. Don't be uh, defeated by the score, and certainly don't get overconfident because of the score. And you just go play every pitch uh, and every out and every inning and you give your best. And, um, you know, it may not always work your way, but, um, you know, you know, you've given your best and, and sometimes um, the outcome will surprise you. When you first got into the game, did you think that you would have learned so much from it? No, I, I pursued the game because I loved it. And um, probably, you know, I was probably more uh, selfish in my own ambition. Uh, when, I was, when I was done playing as a college player, I signed with an independent team. I was released from there. Billy Brown at George Mason asked me to come coach. He knew I wanted to coach every uh, everybody in the region knew that I wanted to coach. I made it very clear when I was a player that when my time was done, I, I wanted to be a coach. And so like anybody else, you become a coach and I'm, I'm, I want to be a head coach and I'm pursuing that. And, and uh, you know, I, I wanted to be a head coach. And, and, uh, and then when, um, when a couple teams called and asked me to scout, you know, I, said, no, I'm not interested. I'm, I'm going to pursue this college coaching thing. And then the Braves called and I told them the same thing. I said, look, I'm really not interested. I'm going to pursue this, this uh, college coaching uh, positions and, and I want to be a head coach. And then I got to thinking about it and I said, you know what? Um, Roy Clark actually convinced me to go meet with um, uh, Chuck Lamar and, and Donnie Mitchell and Scott Profrock and, and some others in Atlanta. 
And um, I got to thinking, you know what, this, this might be uh, something that will be beneficial in the future for me, not the Braves, uh, for me. And uh, I look back on that and, and uh, it, it probably um, created exhaustion and worry and, and uh, uh, lack of harmony in personal and professional lives because I, I was pursuing goals that were all about me and instead of what's best for the team. And, and so I learned some hard lessons and, and when it became just about the team, and just whatever value I can bring, whatever that is, I'm gonna do my very, very best. Uh, I'm going to uh, work hard to keep my marriage strong. And then, and then uh, you know, we had children. And then when you have children, Alex, everything changes, right? I mean, now you realize it isn't about you. And, um, and so those are probably the, the biggest things that, that happened to me and what the game taught me. And then, and then when I quit, when I quit trying to get everything I could out of the game and start allowing the game to teach me and mold me, that's when I truly, I believe, learned to, to truly love it. Every single baseball player at some point in their career has to make the decision to hang up the cleats. When you decided to hang up the cleats, what went into that decision and was it hard for you? Well, the reason I hung up the cleats is because I had a lack of talent. I mean, that's, 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 that's the truth. And, uh, I wasn't injured. Uh, I didn't get, you know, screwed by my coach or I just wasn't good enough anymore to play. And, and I didn't, you know, I, I never really came to that conclusion and really until the end, because I always felt that I was going to play in the major leagues. There was never a doubt in my mind that I was going to play in the major leagues. I guess I just wasn't a very good self-evaluator. Um, but you know, I, I knew that when my time had ended again, that I, I wanted to coach and pursue it. Uh, you know, I was always told if you can't play the best, the best thing after that is coaching. Right. And, um, and I still have a desire to get back in, into coach coaching. And, uh, I don't know if I'll, I'll get that opportunity or, uh, if I'll pursue that, I don't know, you know, what God's will is at this point in time for my life, but, um, you know, I, for, for me, um, you know, I, I still have that desire to coach. There's nothing better than just getting a, getting a bunch of guys together and doing life together and, and pursuing this game and encouraging one another, picking each other up and learning from one another. And uh, I mean, it's, it's family, it's community. And uh, there's, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's why we do this. When you say you have a desire to coach still, are you speaking on at the major league level, college level, high school level, summer ball. Uh, I, mean, I would do it probably, I would do it. I, I would probably do it at the amateur level, Alex. I, mean, I think that's, uh, I always felt that you being a junior college coach would, would be, would be one of the best jobs in baseball. Uh, assuming you're in the right place, good administration. Uh, I love being with those kids that people didn't think could make it or, you know, maybe their grades weren't good enough or, or and I was because I was a junior college player and I had people gave me a chance. And um, because of that, I'm grateful. And, and um, you know, I to certainly, you know, feel a calling uh, to make sure that other people get a chance. And um, that's that's all people need. And uh, we're, you know, it's the, the, the one thing I've noticed and it's not really what you ask, but, um, you know, Parents can't be friends with their kids. Coaches can't be friends with their players. Teachers can't be friends with their students. It's got to be great mutual respect and love for one another. Um, but you got to put your relationship on the line. And um, you've got to, there's a fine line there. And um, uh, young people today, they, they want led. They want to be led. Players want to be coached, um, but I can honestly tell you there's not one player I've been around that I haven't respected and had love for them. Um, I love players and I, I love what they're about. And um, again, it's uh, I, I can't say that enough. I and mean, that's what my heart just bleeds out every single day. And uh, and as a coach. You know, you you want if you you want players to feel that, and and once they do feel that and they know that, 
um, they're going to reach their ceiling. And there's nothing that makes you more proud is when your players reach their ceiling. And we get criticized, and I've been criticized, and rightly so, of, of maybe uh, staying with players too long, um, not being as transactional as we need to, de- to be. And we, we need to do a better job of that, and, and I think we will going forward. But uh, I've just always felt the best way to enc- the best way to motivate people is to encourage them and believe in them, and give them multiple chances. I certainly had multiple chances uh, growing up, and mistakes that I made, and, and, and had people believe in me when I'm not sure why they did. And and uh, you know, I just want to I want to do the same for others. This is my favorite part of any interview I do. It's a fast five quick round. It's five quick questions. You have as much time to answer them if needed. Are you ready? Let's go. All right. So the first one, how much does a manager impact a win or loss rate over the course of a 162 game season? Let's just call it a manager war. (laughs) That's a great question. And I I believe in the manager. I believe um, in, in, in that is, it's hard to validate that. Um, you're going to get some people say that uh, you know manager doesn't have a huge impact, and others will will say that you know they, they really really do. And and I, I believe in, in the major league manager, and I, I believe in the atmosphere and the culture that they're able to create in the clubhouse. Uh, there's no doubt that some players enjoy playing for some managers over others. And I think that affects the psyche and the attitude and the concentration and the focus level of the player, which is so necessary and vital to be successful. Players want to know that that manager has their back, but the manager also has to speak truth. And, but you can always speak truth in a very encouraging and positive way. And I, so I think over 162 games, I think the manager has a huge impact in uh, the team reaching their ceiling. Look, talent is what wins. We all know that. And, and, um, but at the end of the day, as a general manager, you just want your team to reach their ceiling. And I think it's impossible to do unless there is a relationship, uh, players, manager, trust with the players and managers, and uh, a trust to allow everybody to do their job and to believe in one another. And I think the manager is the one that ultimately uh, is responsible and creates that in the clubhouse. I think everyone knows that the Royals put makeup right on the top of those the list when thinking about players in their organization. How does Dayton Moore quantify makeup? Well, it's funny you say that because we were looking through um, – a lot of prospect books uh, the last couple of days, you know, obviously we're in a lockout situation right now and we're unable to, to really interact with, with players. We can't interact with players uh, at the major league level. And so we're going through all these prospects and looking at our evaluations over the last, you know, 15 years or so. And it's amazing uh, some of the very talented players that really never reached their ceiling because of mistakes they made poor choices off the field, or they just struggled uh, with diversity, or they struggled with the rhythms of baseball. As I said, managing the failure or whatever. They had a blow up with members of the media. They had a blow up with the members of, of the, the fan base, and they just never reached their their ceiling. And then you have players that, you know, were marginal type talents. I, I think of Martin Prado and Mark DeRosa, who you know players that we had in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, we had a chance to, to scout them as amateurs and be, a, be around them. And, and they, they weren't high profile players. They were never considered prospects in the minor league system. And look how many years they played in the major leagues. And it's because of makeup. It's because they were, they, they gave their best every single day and they cared about their teammates and they didn't take things for granted. I look at Nicky Lopez, what he did this past year. You know, Nicky Lopez got better as the year went on because he didn't take one day for granted. He smiled on the field. He was happy. Um, He wasn't looking over his shoulder or who's coming up. I'm just going to take advantage of this day. I'm going to give everything I have today to get better. And all of a sudden, three months later, four months later, he was pretty good because he just made the main thing the main thing. And that's just go out and play baseball and get better 
each and 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 every day. But so I think makeup is is crucial. I, I I think it's very difficult to separate your personal life and your professional life. I think it's almost impossible in the game of baseball. Football, you can put everything aside, what you're dealing with personally. You can put that aside for one day, for three hours. Baseball, you can. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, how you conduct yourself and, and, and your uh, uh, personal life and the, and the lack of drama, if you will, I think it, it bleeds in. Uh, to your professional life. And, and so it's important to make good choices on the field, off the field. And uh, look, I always told my son, there's two things you want said about you when your time is done playing. You want every player that you ever played with to say you were a good teammate. And if somebody can say you were a great teammate, that would be special. That means you put them first. You celebrated in a genuine way in their successes. You picked them up when they were down. You gave them an encouraged word. You said, I believe in you. Keep fighting. Keep, hey, let's let's work together. Let's get through this together. You served them and you cared about them. And then if every coach that you played for can say, you know what? This guy was an extension of me on the field. Uh, he He listened. He tried to apply what we talked about. He was respectful. Yes, we debated. Yes, we talked through things. Um, but there was genuine respect here. He respected authority. And so if baseball can teach you to serve others and respect authority, you're probably going to be in, in pretty good shape. And so I think makeup is is huge. Would you ever consider going into broadcasting? Well, I don't know if I'd be pretty – I don't know if I'd be, be very good at that. Um, I'm probably a little too opinionated, people might say. Um, but um, – about all aspects of the game. And, and um, so, yeah, I, I don't, I've never thought about that, Alex. What would be your go-to snack? Apple. I love apples. Um, that'd probably be, but that's, that's my go-to snack. All right. And then the last one for the fast five, what is your favorite Gene Watson story? <laughs> There is too many to count, Alex. Gene Watson is one of the most beautiful people in the game. And, um, you know, I, I, I respect him dearly. He loves people. Uh, he's, a, he's a life giver. I mean, uh, Gene Watson, Mike Sweeney, um, Reggie Sanders, Sean Casey, um, you know, guys that, and I was never around Sean Casey a lot, um, but I think of these guys, they just breathe life on people. And Gene Watson breathes life on people, and I and uh, he's positive, and he picks people up. And you know, when you're around Gene Watson, you you have a, you have you're having a better day. He's just he's optimistic. He's positive, he's like like Ned Yost. Ned Yost was very optimistic and, and very positive. But um, without Gene giving me permission to tell some of my favorite stories, I would be hesitant to do so. But um, but uh, he's uh, he's a good person. Then the last question I have for you on this podcast is if a 15 year old walked up to you right now and said, Dayton, I don't like baseball. I'm never going to watch it. What are you saying to that 15 year old kid? Well, if he, if he was a fan that, that walked away from the game um, because of maybe a, a hurt that he's experienced for maybe a parent, a coach, uh, a teammate, whatever that that hurt that he experienced that's driving a wedge between him and something he loved i would just i would tell him this i would share this story with him and and i went through a similar thing in in spring training of 1997 it was my first ever um actually it was 90 um 98 i believe our first year at disney's wide world of sports you'd have to check that but i think it was 98 and I was on a major league front office uh, early in my career. And, and uh, you know, I just I thought the innocence of the game was wasn't there at the major league level. And just some of the things that I was experiencing, the business side of baseball, if you will. Right. Never been a part of that coach, scout. Um, you know, that's that's that was my indoctrination with baseball and, and, and my love affair with the game. And uh, but I remember telling myself uh, at the end of the day in spring training, sitting on a golf cart, 
Dayton, do not let any person, any circumstance, or any situation drive a wedge between you and what you love to do. Don't allow it to happen. Don't give that situation or person or event permission to enter your mind and rob you of your joy of something you love. And so I, I have to admit, Alex, that I've got to remind myself of that conversation that I had with me back then more today than I did before. But I'm glad that I had that defining moment in my life and I would just share that experience with somebody else. And so, again, uh, I, I'm not bashful about sharing my mistakes and my challenges. And I think that's the best way to encourage people. I don't know what you're going through or other people is, are going through, but I, I do care uh, what you're experiencing. Uh, and I do appreciate your story and uh, the challenges that you have in your life. You have to begin, we have to begin to want the same things for other people's children that we want for our own. And you know that's where I go back to the gospels and the gospels tell us to, to love our neighbor as, as self and think of others better than self. And um, there's so much freedom in that. And the world tells you to take care of self, get all you can, you only got one shot at this. And, and I understand that, but you know, you've got to learn to compete for one another. And when, you, when you're competing for somebody else and putting others first, there's just great freedom in that. Even though the world and your flesh is telling you not to do that, you know, but it, when you do, it just gives you just great freedom. You sleep better at night and uh, there's more step and rhythm and tempo in your day. Well, Mr. Moore, I want to say thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. It's certainly a pleasure for you to, to join us on the Whole Story podcast. Well, thanks, Alex. You're a bright light. You're a bright light and you're a joy to talk to.